The worst day of my life started out very nice. I got up at 5.30 and worked out. After I lifted, I ran three miles. It was very foggy, and I was the only one on the track. After the three miles, I cooled down by running the straights and walking the curves. Through two more, I went home and showered. By the time I got dressed for work, Sarah had my muffin and a glass of chocolate milk sitting on the bar. I kissed her and squeezed her up while I gulped the milk. She complained about wrinkling her clothes and messing up her lipstick, but she melted against me. She still made my heart pound every time I saw her. At 31, she was more beautiful than she'd ever been. Her blonde hair was even lighter than it had ever been, almost white, and hanging down to her back. She had filled out nicely from the skinny figure I had seen when we went to prom as seniors. She was still only a little over 5T, but she proved that dynamite comes in small packages. She was a rising star at her law firm and was hitting her stride. After the birth of our girls, she had attracted a lot of attention on some high-profile corporate accounts, and they were talking about partnership. She was making nearly as much as I was, and I was doing very well. I had just been promoted for the fifth time and was the head of the architectural department in a large company of engineers and architects. I kissed her again, grabbed my briefcase and muffin, and went out the door. Have a great day, gorgeous. I waved. She blew me a kiss as she started to get the girls ready for school. She went to work an hour after I did, and I had bedtime duty. My other baby was in the garage, a burnt orange Charger Hellcat. I've been driving Chargers since I was 16. My dad helped me with a 1968 RT that's still parked under the shed. I got it out every now and again to hear the sound of the big hemi through those flow master pipes. It wasn't nearly as quick as the Hellcat. I loved hearing Mustang and Camaro owners brag about their little toys. Just two days before, one of the engineers was bragging about his new Shelby GT 350 over 500 horsepower. He was trying to impress Maria in the next office. I smiled at the thought of the over 700 the Hellcat made. I actually loved all the new pony cars, but they weren't in the same league as the Hellcat Charger or Challenger. Hot Rod owners are a class of people I like, and we all have our own babies and like to needle the other guys. I had a great day at work. I finished the power plant our design team was working on at about 1.30 and took the rest of the afternoon off. I washed my baby. It was a beautiful afternoon, and I could see myself and the girls when I put her in the garage. Sarah texted me and told me she would be a little late. She was in a conference and would be home around 5 o'clock. At 3.30, I was in the kitchen making chocolate chip cookies. I had two pans done and a plate sitting on the bar. I heard the door open and two little angel voices coming through the living room. Two little blonde pixies set their backpacks down and flew across the kitchen to wrap themselves around me. Carmen and Camber, my babies. They're identical twins, the cutest little bundles of joy on God's green earth. They have mom's hair, freckles, and big blue eyes, but they have my complexion. Sarah can tan, but I'm naturally olive-complected, and they got my skin tone. It was a contrast with their hair and those eyes. They were going to break hearts when they were older. At eight, they were just adorable. They fought like hornets, but only with each other and Sarah. They were just honey and silk with me and didn't allow anyone to say anything bad about the other one. Sarah had a rough time dealing with the two of them. I know they loved their mother deeply, but any time she corrected one of them, the other always took her sister's side. They could argue as vociferously as their mother could. They outdid each other, telling me about their day at school, which had just started a week ago. They loved their new teacher, Miss Brooks, who was new to the district. I had yet to meet her, but she'd certainly made an impression on my girls. I fed them chocolate chip cookies and tall glasses of milk while listening to them with an idiot grin on my face. Yes, they were my angels, and they could do no wrong. They each ate three cookies and went upstairs to do their homework. Homework when they got home was my rule, and then we had the rest of the evening to do whatever we wanted. 
I took the last sheet of cookies out of the oven and put them on the platter. I heard Camber call me and started up the stairs. I felt something odd and realized my phone was vibrating. I took it out and saw a text. The number looked familiar, but it wasn't in my contacts. I checked it while climbing the stairs. You are one hot, sexy babe today. I can't wait until tomorrow afternoon. While I appreciated the compliment, I had no idea who would send me such a text, since I had no afternoon planned other than work. I figured someone punched in the wrong number. I decided to play a prank on whoever it was. Thanks, babe. Remind me again about the time and place. I got a message right back. You're using Shell's phone. Make sure you delete this can of Sheldon getting suspicious too soon. Our place, of course. I froze in place halfway into the girl's doorway. I'm Sheldon Clanton, and my phone number ends in 9. Sarah's is the same but ends in 8, and the girls end in 7 and 6. Someone made a big mistake. I was numb, unable to move. Carmen glanced up at me. Daddy, we need help with these math problems. What's wrong, Daddy? Both girls stood up and stared at me. The look on my face must have shocked them. I shook the cobwebs out. Nothing, girls. It's just some bad news. Nothing to worry about, my babies. I lied. Let them see the math. Five minutes later, I heard the garage door go up. Sarah was home. I heard her walking around. And in a minute, she poked her head in. What's for dinner? She asked. Hey, sweethearts. They bounced up and went to hug her. They came back and sat down and Sarah came up and put her arms around my neck from behind. She nibbled on my ear. I'm going to grab a quick shower, she said. We finished the math. And I asked the munchkins if they wanted to go out to Incredible Pizza. They were all over it, and by the time they got dressed in shorts and t-shirts, I was waiting in the car. Isn't mom coming? Carmen asked. She had a long day, I told them. Let her rest. We'll turn off our phones, and it's just me and my angels tonight. We were down, and we had a great time. I forgot to turn my phone off, and it vibrated a dozen times. I ignored it, and dove back into the games, and the mediocre pizza. We got home at 9.30, and Sarah was asleep on the sofa with her phone in her hand. I held my finger to my lips, and we tipped it upstairs. They got in bed and I went to get my clothes for tomorrow. I went to the spare bedroom and locked the door. I lay awake until midnight and heard a soft knock on the door. Shell, what are you doing? I heard a stage whisper. Where did you go, and why is the door locked? Why are you in there? I didn't answer, and she knocked several times. She called my name a dozen times before giving up. She obviously didn't want to wake the girls. I heard her footsteps going down the hall toward our room. It had been our room. I didn't know what it was. Now, I was up by 5.30 and took my clothes as I was going into the garage. I heard her alarm go off. I got in the Hellcat and backed out. I saw her come into the garage just as the door went down, and I drove to the park. I usually ran at the high school track, but I ran at the park that day. My phone went off a dozen times, but I ignored it. I showered and got dressed for work. I got my buddy Marcus to loan me his Ultima at noon. I felt like I was betraying everything I believed in by getting in that thing, but it looked like every other little box-shaped car on the road, and I wanted to blend in. Sarah's car was at the office, and I pulled up across the street and waited. The windows were dark, and I knew no one could see me inside. At 2.30, Sarah came out and got in her BMW. I followed her at a discreet distance, and we drove out into the suburbs. When she turned into a subdivision, I knew where we were going. My brother Mark lived there. What the hell? Well, this kind of sucked. Now I knew why the number looked familiar. I'd never gotten along well with him, and we didn't talk much. The only time I saw him was at family events, and that was too often to suit me. I saw him put his hand on Sarah's hips two years ago and I decked him. We hadn't spoken since, although his wife and Sarah spent a lot of time together. I parked across the street 
and she pulled into his driveway. When she got out, she looked upset. She went in, and I got out and walked around to the back of his house. I had been there a hundred times, but I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Mark's wife, Chloe, was lying out by the pool. This was just getting weirder and weirder. She was a stunning woman, sophisticated and elegant in an understated way. She just exuded class. She looked up at me when she heard the back gate close, and a look of sheer panic ran across her face. Sheldon, she gasped. What are you doing here? I walked up the steps to the deck as Claude jumped up and came running toward me. Shell, wait. Don't go in there. I need to tell you something. Wait. The screen was shut, but I could hear them talking. Sarah was very agitated, and he was trying to calm her down. I'm telling you, something's wrong, she said. He slept in the spare bedroom last night, and he left without even saying the word to me this morning. This was a mistake, Mark. I need more time to get him on board. I know he thinks Chloe is attractive, and we'll just have to let her work on him. I love my husband, and I'm not risking my marriage and my kids over this. You can talk him into it, he told her. We've seen the way he looks at Chloe. Don't get cold feet on me now. We've already talked about this a dozen times, and you know you want to do this. Yes, I've loved it, but I don't want to lose everything. If he gets close to Chloe, he can't say anything, and we'll just swap every now and again. You might as well now that you're here. I can tell you want it. Yes, but not that bad. If Shell ever found out about this, it would kill him. I'm not going to do it, Mark. I peeked in and saw them standing in the living room. He pulled her toward him and kissed her. She resisted for a minute, then let him kiss her. I snapped a couple of pictures and a little video. He was sliding down the zipper of her dress, and she was reaching around to stop him. I had seen enough. They jumped apart when they heard the screen collapse, and I stepped through. Sarah screamed. No. Oh my God. No, Sheldon. This isn't what you think. Please, Shell. I'm so sorry. I kept walking toward them, and Mark was backing away as fast as he could. I just walked past them into the front door. Sarah ran to me and threw her arms around me from behind. Please, Shell, let's just go home. This isn't what it looks like. I promise I'll explain when we get home. I went out without another word and got in the Ultima. All three of them came out and tried to chase me down. I drove back to the office and gave the keys back to Marcus. After 30 minutes, my phone started ringing. I ignored it, and in about five minutes, my secretary buzzed. Your wife is online. She said, tell her I'm not available. I said, I. I spent the rest of the afternoon staring at my computer screen. Your sister-in-law is on the phone. I heard five minutes later and had her put through. What do you want, Chloe? She said, we have to talk about this. She said, why aren't you at home? You need to talk to Sarah. She can explain everything. Mark and I will be there too. We'll talk about it like rational adults. This is your brother and your wife. Shell, you need to calm down. Why is it that when someone screws with you and pisses you off, they always tell you to calm down? That just pissed me off more. I don't have a brother, I told her. If the a-hole is in my house when I get home, I'll tear his nuts off. If I see you there, I'm going to slap you all the way out the door. Don't ever let me see you or hear your voice again. Chloe, you tell a hole that if he sees me, you'd better start running. I hung up the phone. In twenty minutes it was my dad. Sheldon, what's going on? He asked. Your brother and Chloe are here. They said, you've been threatening them. Sarah called, and she was crying and hysterical. I couldn't understand her. What have you done? Sarah is screwing Mark, and he and Chloe were planning to trick me into a wife-swapping thing. Dad, I don't have a brother. If I hear that you've allowed any of the three of them in your house after today, I don't have a father. If Mom lets them in or either of you ever speak their names to me, I won't have a father or mother. Yes, what you raised the a-hole, and now you get to pick a side. Oh yeah, 
You won't have grandchildren either. You can't talk to me like. He started to bluster, and I hung up. Maria came in and asked me something, but I didn't hear what she was saying. Sheldon, I asked you a question, she said in a louder voice. I started. Oh, sorry, Maria. What did you say? Are you okay? She asked. Tears started running down my cheeks, and I couldn't stop them. She walked over and put her arm around my shoulders. Did someone die? She asked. I'm so sorry, Sheldon. Who was it? I think it was my marriage and my family. I told her the whole story came spilling out as I buried my face in my hands and wept. Ten years of my life flashed before my eyes. Ten wonderful years with the woman I loved and the woman I thought loved me. Did she sleep with him? She asked. I think so. I said. She was going to do it again today. She thought I was onto them and wanted to call it off. Why would she do this? Maria, I loved her with every cell in my body. I would have died for her. How could she do this to her girls? What did those two little girls ever do to deserve this? Sheldon, go home and talk to her, she said. Find out the answers to those questions. You never rest easy until you do. I got out of here. I hugged her. Thanks, Maria. You're a good friend. Please don't tell anyone about this. She looked hurt. Jesus, Sheldon, how could you say that? You know I won't tell anyone. I apologized, and she hugged me again. I know you're upset. Just go home and try to work this out. My phone had been going off ever since I got back to the office, ringing on the way home until I turned it off. When I pulled into the garage, Sarah came running out. She stood beside the door, and I just sat there for a minute, collecting myself. She started beating on the window with her fist. Sheldon, just get out and talk to me, please. I'm begging you. Just let me talk to you. I opened the door, and she tried to hug me. I pushed her away. I think she was shocked I wasn't a violent man, and I'd never laid an angry finger on her in our lives. Don't touch me, Sarah. I told her. You make me feel like I need a shower. She burst into tears. Okay, I won't. Please, Shell, just come inside and let me talk to you. You have until the girls get home. I told her, when they get home, the talking is over and we pretend that everything is fine. Do you understand? They aren't involved, and if you upset them in any way, we're done. That's not enough time, she wept. Can we talk again after they go to bed? I don't know, I said. It depends on what you say between now and when I go and pick them up. You have an hour and a half to make the best of it. I will, she promised. Please, can we just go sit down? I followed her into the living room, and she sat on the sofa, patting a place beside her. I sat in the recliner across the coffee table, which made her cry again. She put her hands over her face. You're wasting time, I finally told her. She went and got a towel off the bar and wiped her face as she sat back down. She could hardly talk. She was crying so hard. I'm so sorry, Shell, she said. I made a huge mistake. I never thought you'd find out. I love you so much. Your love stinks like rotting tuna, and it's better you talk about something that makes sense, I asked. Don't be like that, she begged. It sounds so cheap and dirty. It is cheap and dirty. I said there's no way to wrap it up in a ribbon. That's what you were doing. You would have done it today if I hadn't caught you. I never intended to be unfaithful. It just happened. I'm so sorry. She cried harder. I don't know what I was thinking. I was a wild child before we got married, she said. You know that I met Mark before I did you. I slept with him a few times, and after he met Chloe, we still got together occasionally, all three of us. I know you think she's attractive. Shell, I said. I thought we could all. I had to. I finished for her. No, I just wanted us all to love one another. We could all be together. I was going to include you, I swear. Shell, you had a meeting set up this afternoon. No, I told them I wasn't going to do it. She wept. Yes, because you thought I knew what. If I hadn't known, I wasn't going to be unfaithful. It doesn't matter. You did know. How did you know? 
What difference does it make? I yelled, you are going to be unfaithful with that person. Do you know what that makes you? Sarah, please, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I don't know what I was thinking. I didn't think it was going to turn out like this. It doesn't have to be ugly like this. It can be fun. I'll still be with you. You can have a relationship with Chloe. I felt bile rise up in my throat and ran to the bathroom and puked. I needed a minute, and she tried to give me a washcloth and pat me. I pushed her away and rinsed my mouth out. We went back and sat down. Do you hear what you just said? I asked. It can be fun, she said. The next thing you're going to say is it was just casual. Jesus Christ, Sarah, do you know what a stupid cliché that is? You become that makes me want to slap you. Yes, slap me, Shell. I won't say a word. I deserve for you to slap me. Punish me. Do anything you want. Please, just forgive me. I didn't think you'd find out. I never thought about how much this would hurt you until I thought you knew. When you left last night with the girls, I knew something was wrong. And then when you wouldn't sleep in our bed, I just knew you were hurting so badly. I knew you had found out. I wanted to tell you and apologize, but you wouldn't let me in. I got up early so I could tell you and beg you to forgive me, but you left before I had a chance. I should have waited until. Please, Shell, I'm begging you. Do you still love me? Damn you, Sarah. How can you ask me that after what you did? I loved you yesterday morning and last week and for the last ten years, but that didn't stop you from doing it. How in the hell do you expect me to trust you after this? How do you expect me to believe anything you say? I don't know. She wept. I will earn back your trust. I'll prove you can believe me. I'll do anything. Just tell me what you want me to do. Do you want to have a relationship with Chloe or someone else? I won't say anything. Please, just let me earn back a chance. I'm so sorry, she cried. I've made a mistake. I've never loved anyone but you. I never will. Please, Shell, don't hate me. Please forgive me. I don't know what to do, she cried. I'll do anything, though. We can get help. I'll go to counseling. I'll wear a bracelet. I'll quit my job. I'm desperate. Shell, I never wanted to hurt you. I don't want to lose the girls over this. Please, give me a chance to fix this. My God, the girls. I said, I've got to go and get them to clean up. Sarah wasn't in control. If you aren't under control by the time I get back, I swear to God, I'll kick you out of this house. No hint. Do you understand? Stand. Yes, she said. I'll take a bath. I'll be good, I promise. Can we talk again after they go to bed? I don't know, I said. I told her, when they get home, the talking is over, and we pretend that everything is fine. When I pulled up at the school at 5.30 the next morning, I saw them sitting on a bench in front of the school. There was a woman sitting between them with her arms around them. She was a young woman of uncertain ethnicity, maybe Hispanic and black. She looked like she was in her mid-twenties. As I got closer, the full impact struck me. This woman was drop-dead gorgeous. She looked tall and slender, and she had the biggest, warmest brown eyes I'd ever seen. There were flecks of gold in those eyes and a mop of glossy curls on top of her head framed one of the most beautiful faces I'd ever seen. Her skin was a light coffee color and flawless. She smiled as I approached, and her face lit up like a lighthouse. Her teeth flashed, and she nudged the girls. They looked up and saw me coming. They jumped up and flew across the grass, and I was deluged with an avalanche of little girls. You're late, Daddy. I'm sorry, baby, Camber said. I lost track of the time. I told her. It won't happen again. It's okay, Carmen said. Miss Brooks stayed with us. She rose to her feet off the bench, and I was mesmerized as she came and offered me her hand. Mr. Clanton, I'm Carly Brooks, she said. I love your girls. I'm so lucky to have them in my room. Sheldon, I took her hand. She had long, slender fingers, and they felt cool and soft in my hand. I realized I was holding on too long and cheapishly dropped her hand. 
Thank you so much for waiting with him. I'm very sorry, Miss Brooks. I could hardly speak. This woman was a walking dream. She had on a white blouse, and the first two buttons were undone, revealing a smooth neckline. Her presence was captivating. She noticed my confusion, and I swear two little bumps popped up on the ends of her features. Carly, she corrected me, do you think I could talk to you for a minute? Girls, could you wait in the car for a minute? I asked, just for a minute. They hugged their teacher and went off to the car holding hands. She smiled after them. I hope you're very proud of them, she said. They're the sweetest kids in this school. That's why I wanted to talk to you. They were upset this morning. They told me their mother was crying all the way to school until she dropped them off. Is everything okay at home? Has there been a death in the family or something? I swore to myself, no, Carly, everything's not okay. It will be, she said, and I'll make sure this never happens again. Their mother and I are having a rough spot. I'll make sure to keep them out of it. I'm very sorry. Is it something you can talk to me about? I'm a good listener, and I'll do anything for those little girls. Thanks, but I can't talk now. I told her, it's too painful, and I don't know where this is going yet. I appreciate it, though. Maybe when it's all smoother, I'll tell you, but it hurts too much now. Her hand came out, and her fingers gently caressed my jawline. I realized she was very tall, her eyes were almost level with mine, and I'm 6'3". She smiled, her arm dropped, and she walked back to the building. I watched her for a minute. There was one of the most fantastic movements I'd ever seen under that gray skirt. She was poetry in motion. She looked back over her shoulder and smiled when she saw me watching her. My face went red, and I went to the car. I felt the touch of her fingers on my cheek for hours. The munchkins chattered happily until we were almost home. Daddy, Carmen said, Mom was crying this morning. Were you mean to her? I laughed, maybe a little. I won't do it again. Okay, okay. I don't like her to be sad. Bri doesn't like it either. I know I'm sorry. People just fight sometimes. You know I know, Daddy. Camber, Carmen said, is mean to me all the time, but I don't give her the satisfaction of crying. Hey, you're the one that's the big meanie, Carmen objected. I had to laugh. Neither one of you are mean people, just argue sometimes. I'll try to be nicer. You're always nice to us, she said. Sarah was still in the bathroom when we got home, but when she came out, she was pretty normal. Her eyes were a little puffy, but she smiled and hugged the girls. We had a nice dinner, and they sat on the floor at our feet while we watched TV. It was a pleasant interlude, but I was dreading bedtime. I read to them and kissed them goodnight. I saw Sarah watching from the doorway with a sad smile on her face. She left when I turned out the light, and she was waiting at the foot of the stairs. Do you want to talk in bed? She asked. I'm not sleeping with you. They'll know if you don't. Don't do this, Shell. Let me feel as good as I can. I need you to hold me. I needed you not to be a... Never mind. I caught myself. Tears started running down her cheeks. I lay on my back staring up at the ceiling. I could feel the bed shaking, and I knew she was still crying. Shell, do you want to talk? I'll let you do me any way you want, she whispered. Jesus Christ, you are pathetic. You think I have my brain in my... I exploded. I'm going to the spare bedroom. She grabbed my arm. Please, Shell, I'm sorry. Don't go. Please, just talk to me. I won't touch you. I swore. I don't want to lose you. I don't know what to do or say. I'm just floundering. Please, just punish me and then forgive me. I'll never, no, I won't make any promises. Is there a chance for me to make this up to you? Do I even have a chance? I honestly don't know. Sarah, I despise you so much, it's killing me. I've loved you since we were in high school. I wish I didn't. It wouldn't hurt so bad if I didn't. What can we do? How can we get back to where we were? How do I know you won't just screw the guy to pay the bill? Dan you, Shell. That's not fair. 
I'm not that cheap, and you know it. You're the only man I've ever loved in my life. Don't you tell me what's fair. Is it fair to me that you've been unfaithful for God knows how long? Is it fair that the man that's loved you since we were in high school has to live with the fact that his wife has legs that open for anyone, and that she was trying to trick him into being unfaithful like her two sisters? Is it fair that our girl's mom is a cheating witch? Is it fair that you're a liar and a cheater? Screw you, Sarah. Don't tell me what you are. I know what you are. Screw this. It isn't going to work. I don't want to listen to you. You won't even accept responsibility for what you did. I want you out of here. In the morning, you're going to tell the girls you're going to stay with your sister for a few days. I don't care what excuse you give them. Make something up. You're good at lying. Just be gone when I get home tomorrow, and never tell me that I am the only one that you love. I am better off being hated than being loved by someone like you. She started crying hysterically. I'm sorry, I said. Shell, please don't make me leave. No, you made the choice to be unfaithful without considering me or the girls. I'm making this one, and I'm not considering you. This is my house. I inherited it from my grandparents, and I don't want you here. When can I come back? She wept. I don't know. Maybe never. Don't piss me off, Sarah. Maybe I'll feel better in a while. Maybe you'll come up with some way to fix this, or I'll think of something. I can't breathe with you here. Every time I look at you, I see that you sliding the zipper of your dress down. I'm going to the couch. I left her there crying on the bed and took my pillow to the couch. I left at 5.30 the next morning again, and she wasn't up when I picked the munchkins up after school. They told me she went to stay with Aunt Sophie to help her while she was sick. They were a little upset because they were supposed to work at a 5K run with her on Saturday. I told them I'd work with them instead, and they were happy. Sarah called them, and they talked for a long time. At 8, she texted me, saying, I'm so sorry. I took the day off Friday, and Sophie called me. She wanted to come over and talk to me, and I agreed to talk to her. She's Sarah's little sister, and I'd always had a soft spot for her. She was angry when I answered the door. She swept in and poured herself a cup of coffee. She had been about fourteen when Sarah and I got together, and she was just an angel. She'd spent more time at our house than at her parents after Sarah, and I got married, and we were still really close. What the hell is wrong with you, Sheldon? She spat out. Sarah is struggling over at my house, and you're just sitting here and letting her. She hasn't stopped crying the whole time she's been there. Come and get her, and bring her home. Did she tell you why she's there? So she made a mistake, and was unfaithful with them. Sheldon, she showed affection, and he interacted with her. And they did the wrong thing. You forgave her the last time. What's the big deal? I couldn't believe my ears. What the hell are you talking about? The last time I said I felt very calm. Her eyes got big and she put her hand over her mouth. Oh my God, she gasped. She never told you, did she? She told me. Did she? I said no. I'm going to let her tell you. She promised me she would. And she told me she had. And you had forgiven her. That's all I'm going to say. I'm sorry, Shell. I didn't know what the hell I was talking about. I came over here half-cocked. And I apologize. I'm going to talk to her. She kissed my cheek, and she hadn't been gone ten minutes when the doorbell rang. It was John and Alicia, Sarah's parents. This wasn't going to be pretty. I invited them in, and we sat at the bar drinking coffee. We were very disappointed in you, Sheldon. Alicia started, you're disappointed in me or in Sarah. I asked, you kicked her out of the house. Why would we be disappointed in her? Did she tell you why? I asked. We haven't seen her. Why don't you tell us why? Listen, I love you both. But I'm not telling you anything. If you want to know, ask her. In the meantime, maybe you'd better do a little fact-checking before you're disappointed in anyone. Now you're welcome here anytime. You can see the girls anytime. But don't come back here to have this talk with me again. Find out what's going on. And then we'll talk. One time it's over. 
After that, this really isn't any of your business. Now I have some things to do, so I need to get going. Finish your coffee, wait till the girls get home, whatever, but I've got to get going. I left them there with their mouths open. When I got in the Hellcat, my mind was whirling. The conversation with Sophie had left me reeling, and it had just been delayed by John and Alicia coming over. Obviously, there had been another incident, and Sophie knew about it. Sarah had promised her that she would tell me about it, but she hadn't. This put things in an even worse light. Now, what was I going to do? Driving my baby always gave me at least a temporary peace, and I got on the interstate heading north. There wasn't much traffic, and I opened the hemi up a little. I glanced down and was doing 85. It felt good. I looked in the rearview mirror, and there was a new yellow Mustang GT behind me. He was way too close for the speed we were going, and it pissed me off. I put my foot down, and that big Kimi howled the supercharger wind up, and I took off like I'd been launched. That engine burns 1.5 gallons of gas per minute at full throttle, and the 650 feet olds of torque twisted those wheels like a freight train. The Mustang began to fall back immediately. It hung in there until we passed 120, but when I got to 150, it was just a yellow dot back there. I pulled off at the next exit. I needed gas, and there was a convenience store there. I pulled up to the pump and swiped my credit card. I heard a pretty sweet-sounding engine pull up on the other side of the pumps, but I didn't pay much attention. Sheldon, is that you? I heard a woman's voice call. I looked back, and that yellow Mustang was sitting there. Carly Brooks was getting out. She walked down the pumps toward me. She had on a button-up shirt and jeans. I noticed she had white flip-flops, and her toenails were painted the same yellow as her car. She just looked jaw-dropping. Miss Brooks, why aren't you teaching my daughters how to conjugate verbs? I laughed. She walked up close and leaned against a column. I took a personal day, she said. I thought that was your car that blew by me back there. I tried to catch you and wave. Jesus, that thing's hot. I didn't know you were a car girl, I said. That's a pretty pony you've got there. Is it stock? No, I've put a lot of work into it. I can't believe how you just walked off and left me like that. This is the baddest muscle car ever built. I told her, I like the Mustang though. What are you doing out here? I live here. How about you? Just trying to blow off some steam. I told her, that rough patch I told you about just turned into a mountain, and I just needed to clear some fog out of my brain. Well, driving as fast as we were could have landed us both in jail, she laughed. How about me buying you a cup of coffee and you blow some of that fog my way? Miss Brooks, I don't think you want to hear about my problems. I told her, I told you to call me, Carly. She said, come on, there's a Starbucks down the street. I'll tell you a story, and you can tell me one. I agreed and pumped her gas for her. I followed her, and we went in. I ordered my usual triple espresso, and she got some kind of latte with lots of foam. She took a sip and looked up at me. I couldn't help laughing. I have a mustache, don't I? She grinned. Yep. I cleaned it off with a napkin. Her huge brown eyes held a peculiar look. What's going on with you? Why were you driving so fast? Driving fast to me is like shots of whiskey to other people. When I'm upset, I go for a drive or a run. It calms me down and helps me think. Why did you need a shot? I'm not trying to pry. You just look like you could use someone to talk to. Carly, are you married? No, I was engaged once. Do you mind telling me why you aren't engaged anymore? I, I guess if you're unburdening to me, it would only be fair. She sipped her latte, and I could tell she was gathering her thoughts. I can't do this, she finally said. I'm sorry, Sheldon. I need to go. She stood up, and I could see tears streaming down her high cheekbones. I'm sorry, she threatened to tell me if I didn't. I told her I would, but I couldn't. You were so happy, and I couldn't bear to think about how it would make you feel. It was just. No, I won't say it. I was drunk. 
We were at the girls' Christmas party at school one night. The kids had all gone home, and you went with them. We started drinking, Catholic school things, even Father Peter was tipsy. Mark and Chloe were there. I just started to talk to him. He kept telling me how attractive I was. Do you know how long it's been since anyone besides you told me that? I feel like I'm getting old. My figure is changing. I grow hair in unusual places, and I don't think I'm as pretty as I used to be. Do you know how many men have admired me over the years? I like for men to think I'm attractive. I dance with them, and they try to appreciate me. I would let them sometimes. I always knew that at the end of the night, I was going home to you, and you were going to be with me until I walked funny. It just made me feel good to know that men wanted to spend time with me. They were never going to get there, but it made me feel good knowing they wanted to. Barbara Jansen was there. You remember her. She was a freshman when we were seniors. She was a pretty little blonde who always thought she was something special. She married one of the teachers at the girls' school. She said something to me about looking old. I was drunk, and it really hurt my feelings. Then Mark came over and asked me if I wanted to dance. He was as charming and handsome as ever, and he kept telling me how attractive I was. He kept telling me how good it was back in school. I was as drunk as hell, and I let him talk me into going outside on the porch in the back. It was so stupid, but I was just feeling very vulnerable. I made a mistake. I'm so sorry. I felt disgusted with myself after I did it. I just couldn't believe I was the kind of person that would do something like that. I let him appreciate me, and I gave in. I didn't have a relationship with Sheldon. I just wanted to pay that witch back by showing her I could take a handsome man if I wanted to. I'm so sorry. Sophie came out on the porch with her dad and caught me. She threatened to tell you. She called me all sorts of names and told me I was nuts for messing around with you. She said if I told you, she wouldn't mention it. I couldn't tell you. I was so ashamed, and I was so afraid that you would leave me. I told her, I told you, and you had forgiven me. I wish I had told you. That's when it all started again. I screwed up, Shell. I'm a stupid witch, and I messed up. I'm very sorry. I hate myself, and if I've made you hate me, I don't know how I'll live with myself. I've never loved anyone but you. I never will. Please, Shell, don't hate me. Please forgive me. I swear to God that if you let me make this up to you, I'll work like a slave to do it. I'll do anything you say. Please don't leave me. Please don't take my girls away from me. What can I do? I'll do anything. I know now that you'll never accept it, Sarah. I don't know what you can do. I haven't had time to decide what I'm going to do. How can I trust you? You've lied to me several times. You told me you were working late when you were really out. What if I forgive you and one day you have to work late? What am I supposed to think? How will I keep from wondering if you're seeing someone else or giving him attention? How does that work? She was crying uncontrollably. I don't know, Shell. I only know I love you and the girls. And I see what I've done. I see how my stupidity has damaged us and our family. I don't want relationships anymore with anyone besides you, Shell. I've just been insane. You're an amazing lover, but I just got so emotional thinking about what we did back then. It should be easy for me. I've got the message. What do you want to do? Do you still love me? That's the problem, Sarah. I do still love you. I'm just not sure you ever loved me. I'm not sure I believe you about anything. No, I'm sure I don't. I have to assume everything you tell me is a lie. Are you coming clean with me here? I'll never know. And I don't think I'll ever believe anything you tell me. Here's your chance. If you're hiding something, you should tell me now. It won't make any difference. I couldn't possibly be any more angry with you than I am right now. This is your one chance. I swear to God, I'm being honest. She said, there isn't anything else. I love you, Sheldon. I don't love anyone else, and I never have. I did it. It was just. Don't say it, Sarah, I interrupted her. You were going to cheat, and you did cheat. It wasn't. No, okay. I know you don't want to hear it. 
I just want you to understand it didn't mean anything to me. I'm not in love with Mark and Chloe. It was just exciting. I thought you might like to join us. I can see now that you never would. And it was a mistake. Well, it sure as hell meant something to me. I told her, the fact that it didn't mean anything to you is the problem. If I were to see someone else, would that mean anything to you? It's not the same thing. She said, we were going to include you. You were going to get to spend time with Chloe. She's interested in you. That's exactly the same thing. Screw this. If you're going to try to slide around and evade responsibility and minimize what you've done, this isn't going to work. I'm going to see a lawyer tomorrow, Sarah. I suggest you do the same. She asked why I need to see a lawyer when I file for divorce. You'll need one. I told her. She gave a little screech and collapsed. I didn't say anything, and she wept for about five minutes before she could speak. I don't want a divorce, she sobbed. Please, Shell, why do you want a divorce? I told her, I'll do anything you want. You won't even step up and accept how badly you messed up. I told her, you're trying to make excuses and minimize your actions like it wasn't anything. No, I'm not, she protested. I see how badly this has hurt you, and I'm so sorry. I'm just trying to get you to understand that I love only you. They didn't mean anything to me. You're my man, so you were willing to ignore me for people that didn't mean anything to you. Is that what you're telling me? Is that supposed to reassure me? I don't know what I'm saying, she wept. I'll say anything you want me to. I'm just trying to say something to get another chance, to get you to forgive me. Tell me what you want me to say. How about, I'm sorry, Sheldon, I messed up, and it will never happen again. Yes, I am sorry. I messed up, and I won't do it again. Can I please come back home, Shell? I'm dying without you. It's killing me that I can't be around the girls. I'll do anything. I'll sleep in the spare bedroom. I'll cook and clean, and you can use me any way you want to. You can have company or whatever you need to get over this. I actually might. I told her, do you know that I met someone I'm very interested in? I was afraid she would say no, but she said, go on a date with her, bring her over here, and I'll cook for you. I'm as serious as I can be, Shell. I'll do anything to be part of your life. I'll serve the dinner and treat her nicely if that's what you want. I just want to live with you and the girls. If you want to have a relationship with me, we'll just be friends. Just give me a chance to win you back. I'll never have another man for as long as I live. If you need to get revenge or punish me, I know I deserve it. I'll take my lumps and I'll never complain. Just give me a chance. Let me think about it, I told her. I'll call you tomorrow and let you know what I decide. Don't say one word to the girls. Okay, no, I won't. I'll do anything you say. Thank you for talking to me, Sheldon. I know I don't even deserve that. You're a good man, and I'm taking advantage of you. I'm sorry, but I can't help it. I'm dying inside being apart from my family. Maybe you should have thought of that. No, forget that. I won't beat you up, I said. I need you to talk to some people, pastors or rabbis or counselors or something. I don't think you have the right moral compass. Will you do that? Yes, I'll do anything, she said. She left, and I lay awake most of the night thinking. I didn't want her back. The idea that she couldn't take what she had done seriously, that it didn't mean anything to her, screwed with my head. How could I take her back when she didn't even see anything wrong with what she did? The only thing she regretted was hurting me and nearly losing her family. That was so messed up on so many levels. I didn't know where to start. The problem was the girls. How could I destroy my children's lives by kicking their mother to the curb? I drifted off to sleep, still confused about what I should do. I got some clarity in the morning. The girls loved their mother, and she was a wonderful mom. They didn't deserve any of this, and I needed to make their lives as good as possible. I was certain that living with someone who had been unfaithful wasn't good for them. I called into work and got the day off. When the girls got up, I told them I was taking them out of school so we could talk. It was the most difficult talk of my life. 
I didn't tell them that their mother was unfaithful. I just told them that we had some issues that we needed to work out. She wouldn't be living with us, and we were trying to work on our problems. They cried like someone had died at first. They accused me of ruining everything. But when I told them I hadn't done anything, they figured it out. Did mom do something bad? Camber asked. I said, I'm not going to tell you anything bad about your mother. She loves you very much, and you shouldn't blame her for anything. This has nothing to do with you girls. You're the best girls I could ever imagine, and we both love you with all our hearts. Just give me a chance to work this out, okay? They reluctantly agreed, and we talked for a long time. I called Sarah, and we met for lunch. She was distraught when I told her I needed some space. I get angry every time I look at you, Sarah, I told her. You need to stay away from me. I've decided that I can never forget what you did. You may have cost me any relationship I have with any of my family. I'm divorcing you, Sarah. I'll let you see the girls any time you want to. We have a prenuptial agreement that if either of us ever cheated, the innocent party keeps the house. You won't be hurting for money. I'll make sure of that. Now the situation escalated. She called me every name in the book, promised to turn the girls against me, and cleaned me out in court. I wished her well and walked away. Carly called me after school, and she was worried about the girls. She noticed that they weren't at school and was very concerned. I promised her that they were okay, and she asked me if she could come over Saturday and talk to me. There was a car event on Saturday, and I was planning to drive in it. I asked her to go, and she agreed. Sarah picked the girls up in the morning, and I went to pick up Carly. She was as gorgeous as ever. She had the tightest jeans I had ever seen. Her figure was stunning. Her big eyes sparkled, and her presence was captivating. We had a long drive and talked a lot. She finally broke down and told me her story. She had been engaged to a businessman in her hometown. They met in high school and fell in love. She was so happy until she caught her fiancé in the cloakroom with one of her bridesmaids at the wedding. She left without ever saying a word to anyone and just drove away. She had never contacted anyone in her hometown again. She ended up in our town and got a job teaching at the school where the girls went. She was obviously upset, and the memory was still fresh and painful to her. I knew exactly how she felt. I told her what was going on with Sarah and me. Her eyes were filled with tears when I finished talking, and mine were a little misty too. She leaned over and put her head on my shoulder. Her hair was just a big mop with all these curls about a foot long that stuck up every which way. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever seen. My phone buzzed after we got to the show, and it was Mom. Sheldon, we need to sit down and talk. I'm calling a family meeting. Gail and Helen are driving down, and we'll meet here at the house. Is A.O. going to be there? I asked. Your brother has some things he needs to tell you. I told you what was going to happen. Don't call me again, Mom. Sheldon, don't be like that, she begged. Okay, he won't be there. Will you come? Hold on a minute. I told her Carly was trying to get my attention. Talk to them. Sheldon, it's the only way to move on. Have you talked to your family? I asked. She grinned ruefully. No, but I know I should, and so should you. Okay, Mom, when is this meeting? I asked. Dinner tonight at 6. No dinner. I'll be there at 7.30. I ended the call. I had a good time with Carly, and she held my hand while we checked out the cars. We talked quite a bit on the way home, and I asked her if she would come over afterward so I could fill her in. She promised, and I dropped her off at her place. I was dreading the hell out of this. I went home to my empty house and tried to eat a little. It just made my stomach upset, and I took a couple of antacids. I got the old charger out and fired it up. It just felt right, and that rumble soothed my nerves. I'm sure they heard me coming a block away, and Mom came to the door before I got there. She hugged me, and I just stood there stiff as a post. When she looked up at me, there were tears in her eyes. She didn't say anything. She just took my hand and led me inside. I heard the lock click behind me, 
and Dad was standing in front of the door with a baseball bat. We're not going to let you tear this family apart with your stubbornness, he cried. Go and set your stance down. Well, this was going to be interesting. My sisters, Gail and Helen, took my arms, and I sat between them. Then out of Mom's bedroom marched the three cheaters. I looked over at Mom. He's your brother. She's your wife. Close your sister-in-law. We can get past this, okay? Mom, you just lost your son and your only two grandchildren. He's in a hole, not my brother. His wife is a witch who sleeps with both men and women, and that's the 304. I guess that makes you Mama 304. That's the pimp over there by the door. And what are you two? I asked my sisters. We just love you, Shell. Gail said, We're down with whatever you want. I want to leave you. I want to come and stay with me tonight. I want to introduce you to someone. Girls, I thought you were going to help the Mama 304. I said. Camber said, Yes, we're going to help. Helen said, What? You thought we were here to help these scums. Buckets we stood up together and walked toward the door. The pimp made a motion with his bat, and I kicked him in the nuts. He dropped his bat and sank to the floor, making a little wheezing sound. I picked up the bat and turned around. The ahole saw death in my eyes and took off running through the kitchen and out the back door. I turned to the witch. Her eyes went wide, and she started scrambling to follow her a whole husband. I threw back my head and laughed. I'm filing charges against you for unlawful imprisonment. I told Mama 304, don't call, don't write, don't send cards and don't attempt to contact the girls. I'm getting a restraining order against all of you. She sank to her knees, weeping hysterically. Please, Sheldon, don't do that. I'm sorry. I'll make it up to you. Too late, I told her. You had your chance. You picked a side. Good luck with the rest of your life. Too bad you're going to spend it with people who cheat on their spouses. The restraining order is going to be for you too. I told the 304, you're mentally unstable, and I'll never leave the girls alone with you again. Helen went upstairs and got the twins. They looked at everyone oddly, but didn't say anything. The 304 was crying hysterically. The girls and I went out without another word and walked down the driveway. Do you want to drive? I asked Gail. I tossed her the keys, and she squealed in excitement. Really, Shell, I always wanted to, but you never would let me. You made the right choice. I told them, I love my little sisters. I let them drive my cars. We got Chinese carryout on the way home, and Helen took a turn trying to break our necks. I called Carly on the way home, and we got food for her too. The twins went flying across the room when she came in and threw themselves on her. They each took a hand and let her talk to their aunts. This is our teacher, Miss Brooks. Camber introduced her. I think she's daddy's girlfriend too. Carly was blushing furiously, and she just looked adorable. Camber, we're just friends. You shouldn't say things like that. Well, since mom cheated, we want you to be with daddy. Carmen told her girls, that's enough. I scolded them, you're embarrassing our guest. Off to bed with you. Sorry, daddy. A soft little chorus came, Helen and Gail, will you read us our book? They led their aunts upstairs and left Carly and me in an awkward silence. I walked toward her and she looked a little frightened. I took her hands and pulled her in for a hug. Her curls tickled my chin and she melted against me. How about it, Carly? I murmured. Want to be my girlfriend? She tilted her head up to look in my eyes. Those huge brown eyes were full of golden glitter. Maybe, she whispered. Kiss me, and then I'll decide. Her lips were the softest, most inviting I'd ever felt. I felt a little pointed tongue tap my lips, and I let it in. I swear to God. I nearly came in my pants when I felt her luscious body press tightly against mine, and she made a little moaning sigh that made me crazy. She pushed back a little and looked at me, evaluating my emotions. Evidently, she liked what she saw because she let me pull her in again, 
burying her face in my shoulder. I won't be with you until you're not with her, she told me. I understand, I told her. I'm not her, Carly. I won't become her either. It's going to take a while to resolve all this. I've got the rest of my life. She said, she kissed me again and made my toes curl, before I walked her out to the pony. I went to see a lawyer the next morning. Her name was Marcy Gray, and she was very rude. I think at first she thought I was dumping my wife for an upgrade. She was about forty, and she had the largest natural breasts I'd ever seen. She was short, very curvy, and pretty too. I wanted her to like me, but we got off on the wrong foot. If you're here to get out of paying child support or maintenance, you need a different attorney, were the first words out of her mouth that pissed me off. Okay, that's not why I'm here, but thanks for seeing me. I got up and walked out. I stopped off at her secretary and asked her how much the appointment was. She opened her mouth, and Miss Gray cut her off. What the hell is the matter with you? She yelled. You can't just walk off like that. Watch me. I told her. I don't know who the hell you think you are, lady, but you can bite me. I don't have to listen to insults, especially not from people I employ. Screw off. She swelled up like a toad frog. She opened her mouth and started laughing. She laughed until she cried and came and got me by the arm. I'm sorry, she was wiping the tears of mirth away. Sometimes I forget that there are decent men in the world. I see so many a holes every day that I forget nobody has talked to me like that for years. Please accept my apology. Come back and talk to me. Tell me what's going on. Despite my misgivings, I let her lead me back into her office, and she poured me a very good scotch. I told her the story, and she got rude all over again, but it was directed mostly against my ex-family and the 304. She buzzed the secretary and got her to bring in forms. I paid her a retainer and signed my name 10,000 times. She promised to get the restraining order that afternoon, and the divorce started as soon as possible. She shook my hand and the ball started rolling. In three days, the 304 was served, and my ex-family was charged with unlawful restraint and terroristic threats. The pimp even got charged with attempted assault for his actions with the baseball bat. The Ahole and his wife were served for inflicting intentional emotional distress. Life looked good. The twins were with me, and the 304 was forbidden to come within 500 feet of us. When I came out to get the papers Saturday morning, she was standing down at the end of the block. She saw me and yelled, Sheldon, please let me see my babies. Please, I'm so sorry, it wasn't my idea. Please, I'm begging you, let me see my babies. A couple of neighbors came outside to see what all the yelling was about. I walked down to where she was, and she fell on her knees in front of me. Please, Sheldon, I'm begging. I'll crawl up to the house if you want me to. Please let me see the girls. Get up, Sarah. I told her. You're embarrassing yourself and me. She said, I know I've lost you, Shell. I can't lose my babies. I won't embarrass you anymore. Please, just for five minutes, let me see them. She clung to me, and I lifted her to her feet. Okay, you can see them, I told her. Sarah. I told you that you could see them any time you wanted to. Then you went and pulled that stunt at my experience house. I swear to God, one more insane moment like that, and you're done. Do you understand? Yes, yes I do, and I won't. I won't do anything crazy. Thank you, Shell. I'll be good. We walked back to the house, and the girls were eating waffles. They flew to her and she knelt down and hugged them like life preservers in a hurricane. She was sobbing her heart out and telling them over and over how sorry she was and how much she loved them. They cried a little too and told her how much they missed her. I fixed her some breakfast, and we all sat around the bar and ate. She promised them and me that she would be their mom just like before, but she wouldn't be living with us. I think they understood, and they agreed to stay with her every other weekend. I told her she could come over any time during the week she wanted. They went off to watch TV, and we sat and talked for a while. Sheldon, she began, 
I'm so sorry for what happened at your parents' house. I didn't want to do it, but your mom said we could fix everything. I realize that's not possible now. I know I've hurt you too badly, but I'm sane now, and I just want whatever relationship you will give me. I want to be friends. Okay. I want more than that, but I realize it isn't going to happen. I'll just be the best friend you ever had. I'll be the girl's mom, and we'll move on with our lives. I signed the divorce papers, and I wouldn't fight it. The financial stuff was fine. I'm going to move into one of our apartments. There's a vacancy next week, and it's a nice one. Can we be friends and co-parents, Sheldon? We have to work on the friends part. I told her. Most of my friends don't. No, never mind. I'll try. Sarah, honestly, I will. I just have a lot of bad feelings for you right now. I'm sure time will heal a lot of that, and we'll get along just fine. Just so you know, I'm not getting back together with you, Sarah. If you've really given that up, then I'm sure we'll be fine. The first time you go on a date, you come and tell me about it, and then I'll believe you about moving on. We'll start working on being friends then. Okay. There were tears in her eyes, but she nodded and hugged me. I felt sorry for her, but it wasn't on me. I offered to take her home, but she told me she was parked down the street at the door. She turned and looked back. I'm sorry, she said. I know, I told her. Me too. Don't keep apologizing, Sarah. I believe you. Let's just move on. I forgive you. I'm still mad, but I'll get over it. Okay. She smiled and nodded, and she was gone. She came over Monday and Wednesday, and on Friday, I let the girls go out to eat with her. We seemed to be settling into a routine, and things were looking up. Marcy Gray called me the next week, and she said the lawyer for my ex-family had talked with her and wanted to set up a meeting. I declined, but she said it was in everyone's best interests, so I went. My only condition was that the a-hole not be there. Everyone agreed, and we sat around Marcy's conference table. They were all very penitent and full of remorse. They wanted me to drop the charges against them, and they were willing to do nearly anything to make that happen. I told them that if they signed agreements to never contact or speak to me again, to agree to never speak to or contact the girls again, and that if the pimp would let me confront him again, I would drop the charges except the ones against the a-hole. Marcy got quite a kick, pun intended, out of that, and they agreed to all of the conditions except the last one. Chloe and Mom agreed, but for some reason, the pimp was reluctant. I guess he needed to be holding a baseball bat to feel comfortable having his actions exposed. Mom threatened to kick him herself, and he finally agreed. Marcy was choking, and I told him I wasn't going to do it right away, but he should be ready. They signed the papers and pulled out as soon as the door closed. Marcy burst into an insane fit of giggling. I told her, a woman with your breast size shouldn't giggle like that, and she ran off to the bathroom. When she came back, she was composed until she saw me, and that set her off again. Sheldon, you're such an idiot, she gasped. You nearly made me pee my pants. You know I couldn't put that in the papers, right? I chuckled. Well, yes, but I love the thought of them worrying about whether today is the day I'm coming to collect. You're a hard skunk. Hard skunk dude, she finally settled down. Are you going to stick to this? You have no idea what I put up with from the a-hole down through the years. I told her. He stole my toys, caused me more trouble than you can ever believe, and it was all okay with him because he was the baby. Jesus Christ, Marcy, he screwed my wife, and they were okay with that. It was my stubborn pride that was the problem. I'm done with them. I hope they all die lonely and in misery. I don't, she said. I blame you. She said, the divorce is final in sixty days. What are you going to do then? Move on. I told her, I've got a couple of plants. I even have a few plans for the a-hole. She looked as serene at me. You aren't going to need a criminal defense lawyer, are you? God, I hope not. I said, are you any good? I practice family law, she said. I'll bail you out, 
but I'd have to recommend a colleague if you're charged with a crime. I didn't expect to be charged. The Ahole was coming out of a bar one night, and three masked men jumped him and dragged him into an alley. They beat the hell out of him, paying special attention to his genital area. The police report said they kept asking him a question over and over, and he couldn't understand it. It was, what's the frequency, Kenneth? I guess they thought he was Dan, rather. He said he didn't know any Kenneth, and he had no idea who they were or what the frequency might be. I was with Sarah and the girls at the time, and I was never questioned. After he got out of the hospital, he was at home while Chloe was out of town, and there was a home invasion. He was beaten again by four guys. This time the question was different. They kept asking him why he wasn't wearing the regulation socks. He had no idea what the regulation socks were supposed to be, so they played ping-pong with his balls. I was out on a date with Carly a month later. He was ambushed in the parking garage at work. He was unable to determine the number of his relatives, but they inquired about the frequency and disapproved of his sock choice again. His male member was victimized by being wrapped in duct tape and used as a hair removal device. He wouldn't need waxing for a while. I was at the Twins' soccer game with Sarah, and the police questioned me that time. It seems that targeting the genitals is a favorite pastime of jealous husbands, but I had airtight alibis for all the attacks. Two months later, his car developed problems three times a week for two weeks. When he came out of work, it had a flat tire. There were mysterious holes in the sidewalls, possibly about the size of an ice pick. Security began to watch it and it recovered its ability to hold air in its tires at work. But when he went in stores or bars or left it alone for a minute, the malady recurred, injector problems. They lined it for a while due to the presence of methane in his fuel. The repairman said it was most likely caused by the mothballs in the gas tank. How they got there remained a mystery. His barbecue grill exploded when he was trying to light it. A month later, there was a gas leak and he was missing his eyebrows and lashes, as well as the front of his combover for a while. This run of ill fortune continued until the culmination of the airbag in his car deploying unexpectedly and causing him to collide with a tree. Of course, the airbag had deflated by that time, and he was injured in the crash and back in the hospital. His wife, the lovely Chloe, decided that his bad luck might begin to affect her and filed for divorce. He was afraid to step outside his door and took a job in Cleveland selling tires. My life was going great. The divorce went through smoothly, and I was a free man. Carly and Sarah walked around each other like two tomcats for about a month, but one day Sarah asked her out for drinks and dancing. Sarah had a date, and she told Carly to tell me about him. He was an accountant, and Carly said his name was Bob. She thought he seemed like a nice guy and he was pretty good-looking, too. The girls got along pretty well, and the tension eased around the house when they were there at the same time. After the date, I started asking Sarah to lunch about once a week, and we started being pretty good friends again. We talked about the kids and how work was going, and I remembered how much I just liked talking to her. She seemed to be doing well, and she told me she really liked Bob. We didn't talk about the past much, and that was good. The Saturday after the divorce was final, Sarah had the girls, and I took Carly out. We drove up to the mountains and went to a big local celebration. We walked around and looked at the crafts, ate some local food, and rode a few carnival rides. I took her dancing that night, and about when we were feeling pretty good and we left, when I dropped her off, she invited me in. And I didn't hesitate. We made wild love that night. In the morning, I saw her looking at me. She tilted her head up to look at me. Sheldon, I'm in love with you, she murmured. Do you love me more than you can imagine? I told her, I thought I'd never be happy again, Carly. I was wrong. My kids make me happy, and you make me happy. I do love you. I think I'm the luckiest guy alive. We should send thee a whole a thank you card. She laughed. Well, I wouldn't go so far as that, but I'm happy here with you too. We whispered things that meant nothing and everything until we drifted off to sleep with that gorgeous woman in my arms. 
After two months, she moved in with me, and the twins rode to school with her every day. After six months, I knew I couldn't live without her, and I bought her a ring. I told the girls I was going to ask her to marry me, and I couldn't believe how excited they were. She was their idol, and they worshipped at her altar. I called Sarah. She wasn't thrilled, but she said she wanted me to be happy. I found out that Bob had popped the question to her, and she had him on hold. She said she was going to say yes, and I wished her well. I hoped she had learned something from her experience, and Bob wasn't going to go through what I had. I didn't say any of that. I took Carly out to a nice Italian place and popped out the ring. She squealed, and there was never any question. When we got home, the girls were waiting up, and they were all over us. Can we call you mother? Camber asked her. We already have a mom, but we decided we want to call you mother. Carly dropped to her knees and squeezed them close. Yes, thank you, girls. It would be an honor to me. I've loved you since the day I met you. You'll always be my little girls. I'm not trying to take your mom's place, but I would be proud for two angels like you to call me mother. We got married, and we're a year in and I love her more every day. I've never been happier, and she's still a wonderful partner in bed. Sarah married Bob, and they have a baby boy. I've never heard from the ex-family, and I don't expect I ever will. My sisters mention them sometimes, but they don't have much to do with them either. Sometimes you just have to live with your choices. They made theirs, and I made mine. The worst day of my life was pretty bad but I have the feeling the best days are still ahead. Carly is going to make sure of that. Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.